Thank you so much for joining me. I'm Nola Simon. I'm the host of the Hybrid Remote Center of Excellence. And today we have Pamela Keller. Uh, she and I met while we were getting certified for UMAP. Uh, one of my previous podcasts uh, had Kristen Sherry on it. And Kristen is the founder and creator of UMAP. Um, and really what that is, is it, it's a coaching program that's designed and based off Gallup, uh, the Strengths Finder. And it's about personalization and coaching to person, a person's strengths and values, and that's how we met. But Pamela has this fantastic background of leadership. Uh, she actually comes from like a, a technical background, a STEM background, um, but she was leading distributed teams around the world well before the pandemic. She has as much depth in terms of uh, hybrid distributed work uh, as I do. She started back in what, 2014? Is that right, Pamela? You want to tell us a little bit about your uh, your background? Absolutely. Thanks so much for welcoming me, Nola. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes, my God, hybrid really started way before the pandemic. And um, just before we went on live, we were talking about all the uh, terrible tools that existed back at this time that, that really haven't been anything close to what we have available today. Uh, but yeah, it started really much earlier. Um, my background is actually business administration. Uh, I've worked as a strategist for a long time, but then changed my career into getting into project management, predominantly in the transportation sector. And actually, I did work for a Canadian company, Bombardier, at that time. And what global companies have in common is they have distributed teams, right? So uh, as I was working in Malaysia, I did have a large part of the team uh, based in Canada. We were working in Malaysia, and at that time, you know, if you really compare the time zones of Canada and Malaysia, there was no overlapping work office hours. So it always meant that one of us was working in night calls, and all of the work was really remotely. When I was sharing documentation remotely, um, working synchronous times, uh, and also managing different cultures. So it was really a very fascinating part. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh... Is that I, I have that background where it was like we we had the majority of our business in the U.S., but we also had a Philippines aspect to it as well too. And and that managing across distance, especially when you're managing different cultures, that that's not for the faint of heart. Especially when you really don't have the technology, um, it's it's a constraint that really um, demands innovation and creativity because you're working with limited. Um, supports, right? So how do you make it work? And that's really where I find the people who have actually been doing this for five or 10 years, well before the pandemic, they come to it with a really different mindset of like, how do we make this work? Because we know it can make it work. It's really just a temporary thing. So how do you really, as a leader, get the best out of your people? Like, how do you become a better leader when you are facing those types of challenges? Really? Yeah. I think when you have such a um, distributed team, one really, there are a couple of elements that I find really important. One is to give a shared, um, shared goal, because if everybody knows what they are working towards, and particularly if everyone understands what their unique contribution is towards they, that goal, then they can be, uh, feel like a part of the overall puzzle, right? And that's when everybody can contribute with their own contribution, otherwise they, they feel lost. So as a leader, I think it's about establishing that clarity of how everyone plays a role. Um, the second aspect that I found really important is communication, because since we are all distributed, we can't just uh, call in for a town hall, bring everyone into a room and, and share the communication and news and updates at the same time. So we need to share it in a way that everybody gets the same information with the same messages. And, and so therefore, we need to be more mindful about how we organize and structure and uh, disseminate our, our communication, right? Whether that's through email or maybe via video or conference call. It simply requires to be more mindful about that communication. 
And I guess the second aspect with the communication also is about being mindful about the receiving end of the communication, because since we don't always see what state of mind the others are, in this case, for example, in the other country, we just need to be mindful about what's going on over there, right? Um, do they maybe have um, concurrent priorities with other projects? Um, how does our project fit in there? Um, are we competing for resources? Um, and is maybe everything clear about the project? So it really requires more mindfulness and I guess also empathy to understand where uh, I was sent and how do we bring them along? Yeah, exactly. And, and honestly, that's a great point too, because you don't know what's actually happening on the ground in a, that country, right? Like it could be something else that's impacting the work. So like weather events, right? Climate change is definitely a thing. We actually, when we established our Philippines location, in part, it was because we had way back in 2003, we had like a national power. It was actually Canada and U.S., a power outage that went down the, the entire eastern seaboard, right? And so that's where they brought in that third resource. But what we found is actually um, the Philippines actually were subject to like tsunamis and flooding mm -hmm. and, and mudslides. And we often ended up being the backup to them because of weather related challenges, right? So yeah, that's another thing to be uh, involved with as well, too, is like how what's happening on the ground that's not even work related, that's going to be impacting how people are feeling how they're approaching the work, how they show up that day, um, yeah. right? And and definitely being mindful and, and empathetic. <laughs> you know, people may have lost family members, right? And if they're at work they at all, them. that's that's just shockingly hard, right? So Exactly. And we don't see that, right? And since we don't see that, we can't pick up on the subtle cues because I think that's the advantage where we do see each other yeah. Uh, we, we can pick up if someone may be a little bit uh, down or they're having a bad day and then we can adjust all the communication and interaction. But when we don't have that information, then we just need to be a bit mindful and uh, maybe pick up on more sub cues on how our colleagues are doing and uh, yeah, and taking in that information. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And again, it might be cultural too. They might even be comfortable sharing the, the emotional aspect, right? So how do you, how do you even know if they're not willing to, to, to share and, and how do you get to a place where everybody feels safe enough, regardless of location and what, whatever's going on in terms of that culture? That, that's, that's a challenge. So yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Because across cultures, we have different types of communicating, right? So especially if we compare, for example, um, Western versus Asian culture in, in Asia, uh, there's a tendency to see, um, uh, you know, not foolish communication, but more humble uh, communication that steps back a little bit uh, to be as something that's aspiring um, versus in the Western world, we tend to be a little bit more uh, stronger in our communication and forthcoming and more direct. So it doesn't mean that one is better or worse. It simply means that it's very different. So understanding also those cultural differences are really important uh, because otherwise it can create misunderstandings, right? It can create a misunderstanding of thinking, oh, um, I'm not being heard or um, I was actually overpowering, but uh, in actual, um, actually, it's actually just the yeah, difference in communication style, not necessarily an intention. So um, managing remote teams is also just really uh, translating any differences between the different sides or cultures and helping them to understand each other and create that mutual understanding. Yeah. So team agreements become really important, right? So standards yes. of communication, when you use email, when you use chat, when you use video, you know, it, or, or even like a combination. So something like Loom, for example, you've got a video, but you're sharing screens so that you can yeah. actually yeah. Uh, even emoji use. <laughs> emoji use is is very problematic sometimes because it really depends on you know your your background your tech savviness your um you know how old you are <laughs> right you approach it very differently and sometimes emojis mean different things to different people even within the same area right so that's yeah. something very true 
And it's so funny that you you mentioned your text and the WhatsApps and so on, because uh, when I started uh, back at that time, this is really like 2012, 14, uh, we were still using Blackberries. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. I didn't even have, I didn't even get a Blackberry. So literally we had email and yeah. cell. <laughs> yeah. And that really <laughs> was it. And then gradually yeah. we started getting like WebEx and that type of video kind of webinar software. But it, yep. it took time. It really did take time. And it's amazing what we take for granted these days. And actually that becomes its own problem because nowadays we have so many channels that that's where it's like that team agreement becomes important to actually define what's going to work best in certain specific situations, right? Because everybody comes to it differently. Everybody has different technical understandings of how to use those different systems and when. Um, yeah. And so that, that can become a challenge as well, too. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. That, that agreement is really important because otherwise it's a challenge of uh, where did I communicate what and where do I find the information? Um, okay. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, another aspect that's also important is to uh, find ways of how to create that team cohesion, right? Mm -hmm. Because um, when you, we start often a project with people who are distributed by uh, just meeting individual people. And as we go through the phases of storming, norming, forming, and performing, um, we get to develop that uh, cohesion with others. We get to um, get to know our team members better. We get to appreciate them as human beings better. And I guess that relates to our earlier point, really, how to create empathy. How do I know what's going on in uh, my colleague's life and uh, how can I be mindful of that? Yeah, exactly. But it also leads into things like uh, job crafting. So if, again, coming back to like UMAP and that personalization, how do you work with an individual and and optimize, you know, their natural skills, their, you know, their values so that the work feels more like flow? Is it possible that there's work that they're doing that really is is really not ideal for them, but you could kind of rejig it in the team and reassign tasks to people who would enjoy that more, right? So that's job crafting, that's personalization, and it's optimizing. The, the, the employee experience for those individual employees, because the goal is really to make sure that the team is performing at its peak. If you're really rigid in terms of job descriptions um, and, and you don't have that type of flexibility, that can be cause its own problem as well too, right? Do you have experience like that where you've actually structured or restructured job descriptions and like reassigned tasks within a team? Yeah, we did uh, quite a lot. Actually, if I do take that that project as well, um, we ramped up and scaled the team from initially in Malaysia, initially five people to over 100 over the, over a couple of months. Wow. It was a pretty rapid um, scale and growth. We actually had to continuously change the roles in the team because as we had new team members coming in, we had to change a little bit the reporting lines, um, and also adjust depending who else came in and what additional experience we were able to recruit into the team. So yes, I think as good leaders, we need to continuously keep an eye in terms of what small changes lead to better results for the overall team. Yeah, no, exactly. And I actually find that that's, that's a compelling use for AI as well, too, because you don't know what you don't know about people, right? So there is software out there that can actually identify the skills um, and and really kind of identify like the um, the the complementary skills that you don't even realize as a leader people have, right? They may not have told you, but it might be information that the company has because it's on their resume, it's in their background, it's in their certifications. Um, there was one example that I came across and it was just, um, they were looking for, people who had a math background and it caught my attention because I have a math background, right? But they were working as customer service, but with a little bit of a, an additional training, they were actually able to move them into a data strategist role and uh, increase their salary three times just by knowing that those skills existed and yeah. realigning them. And so that's a fantastic yeah. way to retain people is how can you take those skills that, that are innate to that person and then redeploy them into something that's actually going to be future focused 
and it's going to benefit mm-hmm. the company more than where they actually enter the company. Yes, absolutely. Well, that's a fantastic story because, you know, we have so many new roles that are being created, uh, particularly in the STEM sector, right? There are so many new uh roles and um, responsibilities that didn't exist in the past. So people not necessarily bring five or 10 years experience in those things. But also because the STEM sector is growing so rapidly, we will need to be able to find people who can transfer their skills and knowledge into the STEM sector. And and I guess it's funny uh, that you mentioned that because I guess I was one of those, because uh, my background is not a technical background. I started business administration. But I've always worked in strategy and in strategy, what we're after, it's about finding solutions, solving complex problems, right? Breaking it down into sub-elements, analyzing it, finding solutions, and then implementing a solution. And I think why I was able to make the transition into managing engineering projects, it's because it's the same. It's about managing a complex project, breaking it down into sub-elements, analyzing it, finding a solution, and putting it together into an overall plan. And um, so I think it was that capability that I was able to transfer. And you're right. If we dedicate more time with our employees to helping them transfer the skills that they have already, we could actually multiply uh, the capability that already sit in our organization. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like sometimes the people who have these capabilities don't even realize how valuable they are. And that's where it's like, how can you supercharge it? And we were talking before about, you know, when when you're working from home, especially women, they tend to have like a smaller network. They don't necessarily get out uh, to, you know, events or they show up to networking agreements or, or, or events. They don't necessarily present themselves in the same way that a man would, right? Um, it, it's really just the reality of, of gender. So this is a way that people can become more visible in a way that's much more personalized and comfortable. and And that's a way that as leaders and managers, we can really kind of help women overcome this perceived barrier of remote work. Because personally, I think it is a perception, right? It's really how you use the tools. But I think there's an onus and a responsibility on on managers and leaders to really dedicate themselves to looking at these opportunities. Yeah, I I agree. I think uh, especially if you're in your early career, you don't always know how do my skills play a role. First of all, to understand what are the skills and the innate talents that I have, that's the first challenge. Unfortunately, it's still not something that it's uh, taught at schools. I think all of us should learn that at school already. So that's the first hurdle, right? Understanding what is it that I'm really good at and that can help me to create value. Then the second uh, step is to map that with what is a uh, role or responsibility that really matches that skill fantastically? And I think here yeah, it's really that collaboration between individuals, but I think you're right, probably the onus on the employer, because the employer requirements are obviously continuously changing. As the market changes, as dynamics changes, the roles change as well. So uh, as employees, particularly early in our career, we don't necessarily have that full of you. And therefore, we don't always have that overview of understanding where do I fit best. I think it's having that continued conversation about how else could I contribute. It's not just one role. We often can contribute in various roles. Yeah, exactly. And that's where, you know, the role of like a manager or a leader is really kind of morphing and changing and being more of a coach, right? And it's that ability to identify the, the raw talent and skills and just mindset really that exists in the individuals and then getting them to the right direction. And that's where it's like, it's, yes, there's, you know, technical aspects and and transactional things that you're responsible for, but that leadership and that coaching ability, that's where you're going to retain people. That's where you're really going to set them up for success in the future. And if you're doing that on an individual uh, basis, you're setting the organization up. And that's where I see successful organizations are really dedicating themselves to this type of upskilling and it's unlearning too. Like, what do you have to unlearn and what do you have to relearn and what new things can you learn? Yeah. So that we're all positioned well for like, not just what's happening right now, but five or 10 years from now. And this is where I call my, my role, the hyper remote futurist, because 
it's not just a solution for right now. It's like what's going to happen in the future. So are you seeing aspects of that when you're working with leaders? Because you're, you're helping them become better leaders. But, you know, are, are you seeing this type of instinct? Yes, absolutely, Nola, because the, cha- the, the environment is changing much quicker, much more rapidly, um, whether that's from the market perspective and customer requirements changing, which influence the organization, or also competition, right? We, we see more and more disruptive market entrants, and that changes really everything in the market. So what it means for organizations is that we need to be able to adapt quicker. And if we want to develop better adaptability on an organizational level, it really means we need to understand our, our teams much better because it's easy to just adapt and change tools. It's relatively easy to adapt and change sites. But what is much more difficult to adapt and change is our human capital, right? Because when we have large teams, how do you bring everyone across? It's really change management and helping everyone along the change. And that starts with each individual. Yeah. So you're right. I fully support that the, uh, the role of leaders in the future is really to become a coach for their team member. And what I like saying is the following. I really like that you emphasize we also need to learn to let go or to unlearn things. Because when we grow in our leadership journey, when we step from being an individual contributor to being a leader, we need to learn to stop doing, but rather learn to lead, right? Because we sometimes make the mistake of still continuing to do ourselves as mm. a leader, but then we're leader, then we remain individual contributors. So if we're stuck in doing, then our work day is occupied with doing. Then we don't have time to think about how to lead strategically, how to develop the capabilities of our teams, or how to, um, for example, look for collaboration and manage our stakeholders as well. So yes, we have to let go of doing and focusing on leading. Yeah, exactly. That's right. And um, the other thing I wanted to bring this back to is how is it different for women when it comes to this type of leadership? Because there's a lot of studies that have come out that say basically if you can get women uh, women into C-suite, we look at things differently in terms of that collaborative aspect, right? And we focus more on um, you know, that, that research and development aspect, right? No. What are your thoughts yeah. on? Yeah, there's a lot of research that has gone into identifying that when teams are more diverse, um, whether that's women or people from, um, from other backgrounds, that companies are much more, uh, they are better in terms of performance, they're more innovative, and it actually reduces risk. And that the background is really that we simply allow ourselves to take in views that are non-homogeneous, right? We suddenly understand views, different perspectives that we wouldn't have considered in the past. And I think particularly as we have these global challenges around the world, and as we see markets evolving very differently, the number one uh, implement we need is different ways of thinking because we do need different ways of thinking to find solutions for these disruptive problems that we are experiencing, right? I think organizations really need to tap into this diverse talent pool for the future. That is why we're encouraging more women to grow into leadership roles, but it really is a a story with two sides. On one hand, obviously, we want to encourage more women to uh, step into leadership roles. But it's not like they don't want to, right? Women do want to step up into leadership roles. And that leads me to the other side. Unfortunately, we have in in organizations and a society overall, we still have challenges that make it difficult for women to succeed in leadership roles. It's because it's really a historical shift that we're currently seeing. If you really look back 100 years ago, um, probably thousands of years ago, uh, really our society has been dominated by men, structured, organized by men. So we're slowly shifting away from our male leadership style and including the perspectives of other backgrounds as well. And that's that's where we currently uh, are with our society and with organizations. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And it is systemic, right? So an organization does not just exist with those 
people and within the system that it creates, right? It's part of society. It's it's a whole systemic thing that's really feeding into it. And it, it really comes back to, you know, the mental load that caregivers really take to work, right? Because it's not like you're just going to work and becoming a leader. You also have to make arrangements for everything that you have responsibility at home, right? And yeah, absolutely. And it's not only women that caregivers, right? So. Exactly. So that's one of the things that we see where um, companies can't change that only on their own and individuals can't change it on their own. It's really a, a network of several systems, right? And society still plays a role there. Right now, it is a fact that uh, most of the care work is still done by women. And um, one aspect that's really interesting is, is if you compare um, how that evolves between men and women as they progress in their career, as men progress in their career, their share of performing care work reduces. So as men, you know, grow up in the ladder, they do less and less care work. Whereas for women, even though they step up into senior roles, it remains nearly the same. Yeah. Which means as women step up into more complex leadership roles, and obviously they experience challenges there, they still carry the same uh, workload at, at home yeah. and can work. So that creates a, a double workload, which obviously um, does create workload mentally, but also just physically as well. And that is why we do see that uh, women are having a harder time to succeed in senior uh, roles because of the double work. But the other aspect is also that um, we are not used yet to seeing female leaders succeed, particularly in technical roles and STEM roles where women are still the mi minority. Because of them being uh, the minority, many women still experience certain dynamics that don't favor us. Um, a lot of women in STEM sectors report that uh, they feel unseen and not heard because the attention is not towards them. They're in the minority, so they really struggle to be seen. And with that also, there is a strong perception that, um, and experience, not just a perception, but a strong experience that they are constantly being challenged on their competences. Mm. So if you're having a hard time at work to prove yourself, and at home, you're also still doing quite a lot of big work. Right? You're really carrying a lot of burden. And at some stage, you might ask yourself, is this still worth it? Yeah. Well, and we're seeing that not necessarily just in tech, but in politics. So like um, yeah. Jacinda Ardern and Nicola Sturgeon, both uh, from New Zealand yeah. and Scotland, respectively, stepped back from major leadership roles. I mean, Jacinda was um, prime minister, right? And she stepped back. Yeah. In part because of she was just burned out because of the pandemic, yeah. but it's also the hostility and the the constant questioning and even just like the narratives between when a a female leader like that steps back and um, in recently in, in Toronto the the mayor actually stepped back because he didn't resign because he was caught in a cheating scandal. Just the narratives between. Um, why if he stepped back and, and how many people stepped up to support him and how many people yeah. attacked them for stepping down. It's, it's just a long gender. We have a long way to go to really improve yeah. those types of narratives to make it reasonable for and understandable why people actually step back from leadership when there's just too much in their plate. No, yes, absolutely right. And it's really interesting how uh, how the world reacts to that really, right? So yeah. It really shows that there, there's some perception about women's role still deeply ingrained. Mm. And, but that will only change over time. And I know many organizations are working on that. I know also there are lots of allies supporting leaders, whether in organizational politics that are working on helping to transition into a, more, into a world that's more inclusive. But that takes time. And okay. um, what I also want to highlight to women who want to step into a leadership role is um, we can't let ourselves uh, distract from that and giving up. We do need to take a role in leadership as well because we want to co-create the organizations and the society of the future. So we need to take an active role. Uh, so the question is, how do we surround ourselves with the support that allows us to work in an environment which is maybe not necessarily always uh, supportive, uh, but in a way that we can change it 
to be more inclusive. And there are ways how to do it. But I think what I always like to emphasize is changing the perspective towards how can I help change this environment? How can I help to make it better? Yeah. And the magic question that often comes up, and it comes from Zoe Chance. I've, I've talked about her before on other podcasts. Um, she's a professor at, at Harvard. She asks this question, what would it take? Right? It's, it's the, the epitome of influence is, you know, we know we can do it. It's just what it's going to take to be able to do that. Right? And it frees up the imagination because it's a really open-ended question. Right? It's not yes or no. It's what would it take? to be able to do that. And she actually, she, she's interesting because she actually had her students take uh, a paperclip and she, they trade it up. And so what can you trade a paperclip up into? Um, and it's all of this negotiation strategy. And a lot of this is negotiation, right? Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Yes. What's it gonna take um, for leadership roles in the future to be a uh, to, uh, for, for, uh, for anybody, for the representation of leadership roles to be more equitable, right? I, mm. I find it's really a system. It's a couple of things. Yeah. There's not an answer to that. Um, it requires for society to change, which means we individuals as well as part of society, but we also need to see what we need to change ourselves, our direct environment, and then how can we influence the overall society. Um, and it does require also organizations to change. Yeah, and I think organizations are picking up on that. So, if I take uh, one example, one aspect of how organizations can help for more women to participate in leadership roles is to offer more flexible uh, work environments and to offer, in particular, in leadership roles, alternative role models, alternative role structures. So, what I start seeing more and more is, for example. Share leadership roles where, for so example, two people would share a leadership role. Yeah. And, and I think that's a fantastic idea. Why should it definitely not work? I mean, CEOs are able to manage several portfolios, right? So, <laughs> of course, that uh, me as an individual leader, I can also just manage uh, one or two divisions as well. So, that's awesome. I think it just requires the willingness to start uh, working with those models. Yeah. And and right. is, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, that's okay. I was just going to say, have you heard of Rollshare? It's actually a company. I think it's based in the UK, but that's, that's okay. not actually what they do. I think uh, Linda Gratton, uh, she's, she's part of one of the business schools. She's one of the founders uh, or one of the main investors in that, but that's what Rollshare does. And I know Marks and Spencers, for example, it's not even just executives that can view this. Marks and Spencers has actually invested in role sharing with frontline staff to give them that flexibility because their work is done in person, right? So how do you yeah. give frontline staff who can't necessarily work from home in that particular role, how do you give them more flexibility? And role sharing is one answer. So it gives them, they can't necessarily give them location uh, flexibility for the majority of their work, but they can give them time flexibility. And maybe, right. you know, if they have to do training and whatnot, that type of training can then be done at home, right? Because they're doing yeah. it yeah. So that role modeling, it's, it's how do we do things differently going forward? And it can be at all levels. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, look, you can also see it. some companies in the past um, already had established um, dual leadership roles where you would have a technical lead and a commercial lead together sharing the lead roles. So if that already worked in the past, then why can't we do it now? So I think we can. Uh, the question is really just willingness to stop implementing it. And the third aspect, I think, in that system of society needs to change, organizations are changing. The third aspect is also individuals. Um, as individuals, we also need to go through a learning curve. Uh, and that requires, for example, we as women, we have been socialized in a certain way. You know? And we have been socialized sometimes also with very subtle signs. <laughs> whether it's advertising or the way how we've been raised, subtle signs uh, that, for example, suggest we need to be perfect, subtle signs that suggest we shouldn't be loud, and maybe subtle signs that um, the step is not for us. And I'm, I'm laughing at this because uh, uh, unfortunately still we see that in some advertising. Now, mm -hmm. 
what we need to do is um, closing the loop with what you said uh, earlier is we also need to unlearn some of those things that don't serve us. So we have to unlearn some of those notions that have been um, that we have received suddenly and rather become active and ask ourselves, well, what do I want to have instead? What is instead my vision of myself? How can I be a leader? And what would be a leadership style that's actually authentic to myself? Because particularly for women, since we don't have many female role models, and I like saying accessible female role models, because for example, Jacinda Arden, I love her, she's amazing. But she's not accessible to me. I can't call her and ask her, hey, how would you go about the situation, right? So we do need more accessible female role models with whom we can exchange how you go about the situations, how you develop your leadership style so that we allow women to develop a leadership style that's really more congruent with themselves. And that's also going to help them to build up a resilience to, um, to last in a long time career. Yeah, exactly. And that's where mentorship and sponsorship really becomes uh, a thing as well, too. Um, you know, it's, there was something that was floating around on the internet the other day. I can't remember who it was, but it was just basically like if a woman is talented enough to get that type of leadership training and support and she's promoted, then why is there no accountability for the people who bring her up to really make sure that she's got everything uh, that she needs to succeed? And that's rarely where sponsorship comes in. Oh, I know. It was from Inia Ibarra from London Business School. Um, and that's where sponsorship is like, it's different from mentorship. So mentorship is, you know, I'll teach you what I know and I'll help you along and, and coach you. But sponsorship is, I'm going to put you in the position where I'm mentioning your name, I'm putting you forward, I'm advocating for you. And I have that responsibility to you where I'm really going to not just help you, but I'm going to advocate for you and mention your name in the rooms that you don't have access to. Yeah, absolutely. And we, we need both because like I say, it's very different type of support. And ideally, surround yourself with all different types of support, whether it's mentoring, um, sponsoring, or I would throw in also coaching, uh, because I find that all three have a different aspect. Um, and maybe the difference between mentoring and coaching is in mentoring, you have someone sharing their experience and perspective, whereas the coach would have more frameworks and probably more professional tools that they can apply to help, um, for example, help you discover your authentic leadership style. So tapping into all three is really important. And here is one aspect that studies have shown that um, women don't tend to proactively ask for the type of support versus men continuously asking like, hey, I need a mentor or a sponsor. And we women tend to not to do that. So I think we need to step outside of our comfort zone, ask for that support, accept it, and then really leverage it as well. I actually advocated so hard for mentorship and sponsorship that I actually got a message sent down through channels through our women's ERG that I had to stop. <laughs> because they weren't ready to do anything at a global level um, like they had told me they were going to and I had to back off. So it's like, yeah, yeah. You have to be careful with that visibility too. Um, and there was something that I, I wanted to bring in. We, we had a chat just before the podcast as well too. Visibility is really important because no. you can build up and supercharge your networks if you are being visible. And you can do this in multiple different ways. The way that I did it was using employee resource groups, volunteering, uh, hackathons, innovation challenges. So when I changed jobs in 2019, I walked into a new job. Within six weeks, I was connected to 200 people in the, the new division. And I also was a finalist for an innovation challenge, which meant that I was in front of the senior executive leadership team for that particular division. And that's unheard of for a new employee because honestly, by the end of six weeks, most people are really just finishing their onboarding. And I'm like, I'm explaining to my boss who these people are. <laughs> so Amazing. most people don't do that, right? Yeah. And that's where it's like, there's an opportunity. You don't have to go cleanse the blazing like I do. So you get messages from the global HR uh, people, chief people officer. But um, 
you know, you can find that, that sweet spot that's going to be comfortable for you, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, one sentence that I tend to hear quite often is, oh, I don't like to promote myself. I prefer my work to speak for itself. That's a sentence that I've heard so many times. And, and I have them the following answer. And I say, like, have a think about who are the people who actually get to see your results? Because quite often, it's only a direct manager and maybe our team, and that's it. So how can you create an impact when your sphere of influence is that small? All right. So if we actually want to create an impact and have our solution seen and heard, we also need to work help. We also need to work on expanding that network. Yeah. And there are a couple of ways how to do that. You've already mentioned a few. It's about um, talking about uh, your contributions. I think what some people are scared of is uh, to uh, stand on a stage and uh, I just say, "Hey, look at me! How great am I?" I think that focus needs to shift not from you, shift it from you to what is it that you're talking about? What's the contribution you're making? Making it about that value because that's what people are interested in. People want to know what what are you crazy working on? How do you go about it? What are the solutions that you have developed? So people are actually interested in that exchange. So what you can do is reach out to people beyond your team, get to know people, and simply share what's on your what's on your plate, what I'm actually talking about, working on. And you'll be surprised people do want to know an exchange. Yeah, exactly. And honestly, that's that's a uh, thing that happened in the pandemic, that the silos increased because as people were mm-hmm. leaving organizations, um, you know, for whatever reason, uh, the connections between divisions really kind of narrowed. So if you are a bridge builder and you're that type of person who can see connections between sales and marketing and technology, and you can introduce people and you're going to help the organization build up those bridges, communication is going to flow through the organization better. But then you are known as a super connector. You're the you know, And that is where you can actually shift the power dynamic of, you know, you're one of many employees to you are one of a few people in the organization who has those types of connections and in, who is known for that type of work, right? You're shifting your power dynamic, which is going to help you influence how people see you and you can bring that with you into whatever role you go into. Yeah, absolutely. I love how you um, highlight that aspect of becoming a power connector. And with that, you, you create so much value for the organization. And I think a second value is the following. It's uh, not only about the, the networking that you do, but also what you create with that network. So if you have a chance now to reach out to other people to have ideas or to collect new ideas, to see how they come together, then you're creating suddenly new value that maybe it wouldn't have otherwise connected uh, or created if you had only been alone on your own. So you can actually really increase your performance and creativity by harnessing the power of network. Yeah, and it's that, di- that diversity of thought. Like, sure, you might be in accounting, but could you actually bring in, you know, what the IT person knows, what the sales and marketing person knows, and then all of a sudden you are the creative fun CFO with a super savvy tech side to yourself right so then all of a sudden like that's that stands out right yeah absolutely but you stand out if you suddenly understand oh what would finance say what would the sales team say yeah or you develop solutions where everybody goes like yep that's exactly what we need and we approve it exactly that's right you're helping tell a story that they can relate to, right? Because people and change yeah. happens when the story that people tell themselves changes, right? And yeah. nobody else can change that story, but the individuals have to. So if you're talking in a way and you're doing corporate storytelling, if you're telling that story in a way that hits all of those points for those different areas to relate to, you're, you're good at create magic. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, so that so that network aspect is really so important if we want to grow in our leadership journey because 
as an individual contributor at the beginning of our career, we do work through ourselves. And then maybe we have a team and we create value through our team. But if we want to grow further as um, senior leaders, we actually create value through collaboration, through yeah. stakeholders, and to bringing in completely new perspectives. So networking becomes increasingly important. And I know that everybody feels comfortable with that. Um, as, a, as a little side story, I did not enjoy networking at all. <laughs> I used to be the one who, who loved being on, their, on her own, in front of a laptop and uh, working through Excel files. But it was until I discovered what angle I could take for networking. And I believe each of us can find an angle that they can enjoy in networking. For me, it's the following angle. Um, I love two things that come out from my strengths. Namely, one is to build relationships. And the other one is that I'm just a curious person. I'm a, uh, I'm a learner. Yeah, I love learning. So once I had understood that by, build, by doing networking, I'm actually creating a relationship with individuals I didn't know before. And with individuals from whom I can learn, that suddenly opened up my world to actually embracing networking. Because nowadays, that's, that's what I see when someone says networking. For me, it's an opportunity to get to know someone also on a personal level, you know, have a laugh, exchange life stories. And also true learn from others. So yeah. my advice to people is find find a way, an angle that's going to make networking enjoyable for you. Yeah. And it's about building trust, right? And, and um, mm -hmm. it's David Burkett who actually has this one. And he's like, trust is not given. Trust is not received. Trust is reciprocated. So you have to yeah. know people to be able to reciprocate, right? And um yeah. Another story that I like to share as well, too, and I keep name dropping in this particular episode. I don't know why I don't usually do this, but uh, Dory Clark actually has uh, a story because she's an extreme introvert, even though she's like this massive public speaker. Um, well, see, she actually started speaking because she found it made networking easier because people would approach her after the speech, already having a topic in mind and understanding her mindset about it. And so it became this natural um, conversation that happened afterwards. It wasn't just, you know, her trying to break into conversations at the side. They already had a topic to approach her with, and that made her feel a lot more comfortable in networking. So it's like, again, how can you shift that power dynamic so that it's more of what you want to see in the world? And honestly, this is why I have a podcast. <laughs> yeah, that's like, right. Right? So how, yeah. how, how can you actually shift it so that um, you're networking in a way that it, it's going to work best for you, right? Yes. And that ties back to what uh, we discussed earlier, namely visibility. If you are visible, if people know what you stand for, if people know what uh, experience you have, what thought leadership you have, they will come to you and because they will want to know more about your topic. And um, if you're invisible, um, it's hard. If you're not visible, then people won't come to you. Then the onus will always be on you to yeah. go out and to create that link. Yeah, you want to be a magnet. <laughs> yes. And, <laughs> exactly. And that's why I wanted to have you on because you have that diversity of background because you're based in Germany, but you have this phenomenal uh, background where, you know, you're Asia and Malaysia and, and Australia and Canada and U.S., right? You have this, this network that's actually extensive across the world, right? And I, I, I thought that your, your perspectives would be really interesting. So was there anything that we didn't cover that you would really like to highlight? I think uh, that's all I really just would like to encourage everyone to have a look at leadership positions and how they can make a contribution to bring in their ideas. We've discussed the topics about you know, visibility and being connected. Um, I think those are great areas to start. Okay, awesome. I wonder. And leadership can happen from anywhere, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be you know, one of these positions where, you know, that's, that's the entire job description. Um, yeah. Maybe that's how you start. Find ways to lead within your individual contributor role, and then that can be your, your, your springboard, right? So that's my, my absolutely no that. You know what? One question that I get often asked by uh, people in their early career is to they ask, um, "How do I know if I'm ready for a leadership role? How do I step into a leadership role?" 
And I always like saying leadership is not defined by a job description. It's not defined by a title. Leadership starts within us. It really starts with that idea and ambition to want to contribute. Um, it starts with having a vision of how else could I do a, you know, around the world? How else could I create value? And or also to just see how can I help others? Can I help others to grow, to improve things? If you have ideas how to do things better, you are already a leader by thinking ahead and looking for how to improve things. Yeah. And even if people don't follow you, you can role model. And I also find that that very effective as well, too. I once had an idea. Nobody liked it. <laughs> and so I just did it anyway, because my idea was to really become an internal resource for the external sales team. And nobody would approve it. So I just did it. And then I became, I started getting these calls going, nobody knows how to do this. And everybody in the field is telling me that I need to talk to you. And honestly, that's my favorite thing is like, I've got this idea. I have no idea what to do with it. What can you do to help me? And I have amazing stories that came out of that. So, yeah, just wow, start doing it. What a great. Don't ask, don't ask for permission all the time. <laughs> yeah, just do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, Pamela, thank you so much. I really appreciate you making the time. And um, yeah, we'll make sure all your contact information is in the show notes and uh, um, you know, people can, can contact you and, and talk to you about leadership. So thank you for making the tip. Thanks, Enola. Thanks for having me.